right. Hi, everyone. Last week's election countdown we called Pick and Mix, and we were looking at different manifestos. So this is a bit of a, a progression from that. We're specifically looking at the SNP manifesto, but we're also going to be bringing in some comparisons with uh, what Labour's saying on, on, similar, on similar subjects. During the launch speech, um, Mr Swinney, was, he, he repeatedly returned to saying what people want are politicians who tell you what their values are and then tell you what their policies are going to be based on those values. And that's what's been lacking of late. So we'll just let's listen to that little clip because he, he, he does it really well in, in this little clip. The future of the two-child cap is a simple test. Are you in government to help children out of poverty or are you so morally lost that you push kids into poverty. Our choice to abolish the cap is obvious and it is driven by our values. Those values that demand the removal of the two-child cap also drive the SNP on so many issues, not least nuclear weapons. We will demand an end to the obscene waste of billions of pounds on a new generation of weapons of mass destruction. And while we're talking about waste, SNP MPs will demand that the House of Lords is abolished. Our values, Scotland's choices. Elected government, not ermine-clad cronies. Lift the two-child cap, not the cap on bankers' bonuses. Bairns, not bonds, and investment, not cuts. I believe those choices represent the values that most of us share. They are Scotland's values, and a vote for the SNP a vote for this manifesto is a vote for those values for Scotland. I listened to John Swinney, you know, speech at the launching the manifesto, and so I could think, oh, well, I'll go through and I'll get the main points out, and then I and then I found a Sky video giving the main points in the SNP manifesto. So, well, oh, good, I don't, don't have to do it now. We'll just go through them slide slide by slide, sort of really quickly, and and then we're going to come back to some of them. We noticed very early on that um, John Swinney had a list, doesn't he? He's got an ABC list, which is austerity. Brexit, Brexit and cost of living, cost of living crisis. Well, he's he's added a fourth one to that, which is it's now A B C D, and uh, and D is for democracy. As they have promised, it's you know it's the first page of the manifesto: delivering Scottish independence, rejoining the EU, and I hadn't seen this in the manifesto, but they're also um, proposing to replace first past the post so that's for general elections with single transferable votes which is uh, definitely a good idea yes it is funnily enough i've just been listening to john curtis at an event it was on youtube and they were talking about essentially pr rather than first past the post the parties that benefit from it tend to be the smaller ones we that that's logical isn't it the ones that are squeezed out when it's essentially two big parties they said what people have to realize is that that might mean that some of your far right Farage type parties will end up getting a vote that they wouldn't otherwise have got and and whilst people can then go oh we don't want that actually that's a small price to pay because there are some people who vote for that end of the spectrum i mean whatever you might think of anyone who wants to vote for uh, nigel farage Nevertheless, if they do want to vote for them, and the, and the voting system can always squeeze them out, then those people have actually a fair enough reason for getting fed up with politics and yes, and and you know, and feeling like their voice doesn't count. But the other big benefit, if we you know did away with first past the post, is that the big parties would have to cooperate. Yes, there would be there would be alliances. There would be, um, maybe not coalitions, but certainly alliances the way there is in most other European uh, countries. We're going to definitely come back to, to that one, especially about delivering Scottish independence. But we'll just carry on quickly. The next uh, main point was about taxes, so full devolution of tax powers, maintaining the triple lock of pensions and lowering the rates of VAT for hospitality and tourism. Again, that was another one I, I hadn't noticed when I when I had a quick flick through the, the manifesto. This is where I think it's it's difficult to get your head round some of these because because it's a Westminster election, so really they ought to be talking about reserved areas. But those are then areas that they have no 
power over to deliver so you've kind of got to get your head around the fact that they this isn't them saying we're going to maintain the triple lock on pensions it's that they're going to campaign and support that view they can't yeah. make it happen but yeah. full devolution of tax powers if you had that then you could set the rate of yeah. that at whatever you liked yeah. so it's kind of a mixture there of you know yeah. what you can do now what you what you could press for what you could exactly. do if you had these powers yeah. yeah i mean about lowering the rate of vat for tourism um hospitality i mean there are parts of england and wales that would benefit hugely from that as well not just wouldn't just be a benefit for scotland next one moving on to welfare scrapping the two child benefit cap obviously that's got to be scrapped in westminster holyrood can't increase maternity pay and leave to one year decriminalise drugs for personal use. So, there, I mean, there are support for some of those things in, in other um, in UK parties. I mean, I think the Lib Dems are um, be talking about decriminalising drugs, haven't they? That one is certainly um, one that would make a big impact in Scotland because that then opens the door for, for Holyrood to put in a whole suite of um, yeah. treating it as a public health issue, which we know they want to do. Yeah, yeah and, and indeed. So it's it's interesting. It's uh, they've put it under welfare, isn't it? Because um, yeah. probably would have put it under health. <laughs> Certainly could yeah. have been. And the Tories will put it under justice <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so a bill to protect the NHS from privatisation, boosting spending on the NHS, um, and saying to to England and Wales, you would improve your health um, stat outcomes if you match Scotland's pay deals that we've given to NHS staff. So that's quite, that, there's quite a lot in that. And I, I sort of noticed as she was going through, she was missing out some of the phrases that the First Minister used as he was talking about it. So you know, he'd sort of, he had up NHS is not for sales. So that's a bit of a stronger way of, of putting it. Immigration, devolve powers to create a migration system for Scotland, scrap the Rwanda scheme, reverse moves to stop overseas care workers bringing dependents with them. Oh, that's a clumsy wording, isn't it? That, that may be reverse moves to stop them bringing people in. You, you think, so what, what are you saying? <laughs> that's yeah, clumsy. yes. Allow, Allow overseas care workers to bring dependents with them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's about triple negatives in there, isn't it? I think there must be, yeah, at least. And then the last one is about more about foreign affairs, mediate ceasefire in Gaza, restoring foreign aid, scrapping the Trident nuclear deterrent, deterrent which, I, I, again, the phrase that was used in the actual launch was, you know, the, the one that we, we're quite familiar with, um, it's got one, burns, not bombs. Burns, bombs, yeah. Yeah. That was a sort of quick way through the main points that's there. Um, Labour, of course, is not so keen on some of these. And so on debate night, BBC Scotland, Michael Mara was, was there. He's a Labour MSP. And he got asked a question by a young lad in the audience. Would Keir Starmer give a Section 30 order to Scotland? Keir Starmer said that there won't be a referendum. He's not, he's not in favour of that. Is and that think, democratic? It's so, so, well, it's, well the, question, the question was about Keir Starmer, I'm afraid. That was the question I was asked, Richard. So, and, but I tell you, so there's a big debate, I think, about what is a mandate in this regard. So the majority of people in Scotland show support for independence. You still will not give them a Section 30 order. So, I, I, no, there won't be a Section 30 order. That won't, won't be approved. So I, it's undemocratic. I, I, well, I, yeah. if, I, if, I can say to you, if I can say to you at the moment, I think that what, when I'm out speaking to people, Actually, the relevance of this issue to many people at the moment is very, very low, I have to say. And it's at nowhere level. I understand there are people who are really passionate about it. I understand that. You My know, question what, was what, if it's voted for, though, not how it's feeling now. I think I've answered that question. I think I've answered that question. You know, there will not be a Section 30 order. Do you know, just that's bringing back sort of flashes for me of some of the questions that were asked in the actual manifesto launch easily dealt with i think there by uh, michael mara yes although he, he did make it very clear that there wasn't going to be one yeah and i think that that is in it half the yes movement is also going told you because you know that was the big <laughs> difference between the um the conference motion when humza was first minister when they decided that a majority of seats would lead to a negotiation with Westminster about independence. And Sweeney has, has rode back on that to talking about needing a referendum, which, although he hasn't actually used the phrase that I heard saying Section 30 order, that is the only way open to us to get one. And the answer has not been given, which is what happens when they say no. It's legitimate that you should ask a new government 
you know, this is the way we would like to do it because we think it's the best way to do it. But when they say no, what are you going to do then? And that I don't know what that answer is now. You see, I disagree with you that um, John Swin is somehow rowed back from what was agreed at that conference. I, I don't see that. I mean, it, what was agreed was about if we get a majority of seats, then we'll op open negotiate. There's never, there was, there's never, the word ask does not appear in it. He didn't use the word ask at the, uh, the, the launch. And I noticed that he goes back to the fact that it, Holyrood has a majority of independent support and MSPs. That's the mandate. Westminster has continually refuted it. And, and, and as far as I can see, his, his way of putting it now, his way of approaching it now is, we've already got the mandate. Westminster has been refuting it. This election is a way of putting more pressure, adding pressure to get them to come to negotiate about it. And now that there's going to be a, a change in government, well, very likely, and we're all going to put money on that, uh, even though we're not Tory ministers and people who go and make bets about whether they... <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it would be hard to resist that, wouldn't it? But, you know, obviously shouldn't have done it. And he said, OK, so a new government, we're saying to them, here's the situation, mandate in Holyrood, we've got so many seats, um, you know, ho hopefully they'll be able to say we've won the, uh, we've won this election in Scotland, we want to open negotiations with you. So I, I don't see that as as pulling back somehow. I, I know we kind of, hey folks, Fiona and I kind of don't quite see eye to eye on, the, on this one. So we have wee wrangles in the background, don't we? On the, we the we absolutely do, but we, do. But we, can, we can disagree and still be friends, can't oh, we? Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> and it, I think it is to do with perception and, and yeah. you know, what people, to an extent, you hear what you what you want to hear, don't you? Well, I'll tell you what we could do now. We could have a look at what uh, Kate Forbes said. She was, okay. um, I think this is the one where she was with on the Peston programme. In the Scottish Parliament already, we had our last elections in 2021. There is currently a majority of seats in the Parliament of people who support independence. So we have that mandate in terms of support for independence. The point that we've made in our manifesto is that for those who believe in real change, uh, and not just sort of shifting the deck chairs around as Labour would propose for Scotland. For those who believe in real change, there is an opportunity to uh, acknowledge that in the upcoming election and to vote for uh, a better future for Scotland, that is to vote for, for independence. Now, the language there indicates that we will start discussions with the UK government in order to provide the people of Scotland with a referendum, a means, an internationally recognised means for voting for independence uh, itself. But our, in, our, our manifesto sets out uh, the value of independence, of being able to do things differently. You take, for example, uh, Labour's position on immigration. I would say in Scotland, there's a recognition of the economic benefits of immigration, but neither the Conservative nor Labour, who are going to form the next UK government, are in any way keen to support the positive case for immigration. And that's why we think that powers at a Scottish level are where we should be determining the decisions that matter most. I see, I, I think that answers quite a few of the points that were raised by journalists at the launch. But I think your other point, what happens when they say no, that's still, that's still there. And that's still got to be answered. I mean, I've never thought that there were that Westminster was going to say, oh, yes, OK, we'll start negotiating. They're going to do that. To me, it's such a first move in a, a game of chess. Yeah. So you've, you know, you've moved your pawn two steps forward and you're saying, yeah, what are you going to do now? <laughs> and it will go on. Scottish government can make hay over any refusals that come their way. We get to the next Hollywood election. And I mean, personally, I think the indie supporting parties have to work out a way of working together for that. Yes, to absolutely. absolutely maximise the number of yeah. votes. And it's easier, it's much easier to do it for, for Holyrood because, well, it's partly first past the post, but it's it's also, um, you it's know, uh, uh, proportional. So I, I think myself that it's going to be the result of the Holyrood election that will then enable ScotGov Hopefully, it will enable them to say we've got an even bigger mandate now.
yeah. for independence? Are you going to open negotiations? And if they don't at that point, then I think some of the ideas that at the moment are kind of off field a bit, some of those then maybe move to be more central. One of the things that has not really been very well pushed back on, I think, as yet, is this false equivalence though, between votes for the SNP in a first-past-the-post Westminster election forming pressure on the government. There were eight of the 21 questions that were asked at John Swinney's launch were all essentially the same question, which was, well, if a majority of seats means you've got well, they're, they're using that to mean a mandate, even though they've explained the mandates from the previous parliament, um, then not getting a majority must mean that independence is, is, is off the table. And that's, you know, that, that means you've not got a mandate. The difference is that in Holyrood, it's yeah. not just SNP seats that make up yeah. that plurality. Whereas first past the post, it's only likely to be the SNP that gets any actual yeah. seats because of the system yeah. they use. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. they're saying, the result of votes for one party means no, but the result of votes for more than one party means yes. So it's not the same thing. And, uh, you know, you'd think if you're you're in a journalist, you've got one question to ask the First Minister, seven people in front of you have already asked that question. Yeah, Why would you ask yeah. it an eighth time? Yeah. You know, it's just the, the quality of the unionist press is just absolute despair. Uh, yeah. Seven of them asked a variation on well, what's the point of this mandate? Your MPs can't do anything anyway. And I thought, is that not a really good argument yeah. for independence? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we know exactly. they can't do anything. I know, exactly. I just wish <laughs> it would just be nice if maybe after the seventh attempt, you know, Mr. Swinney had said, I good yeah, you get it now. <laughs> there, you know, kind of, kind of thing. But so I was just gonna put up another couple of clips because one of the, you know, the main focuses in that in the SNP manifesto is about rejoining the EU. There's always questions and, and uh, discussions about, oh yeah, but you join the EU, but then you leave your biggest um, customer down south and you know it won't work, blah, blah, blah. So one is Kate Forbes again, and she's being challenged on the benefits for Scotland of rejoining the EU. Economists have looked at your figures and your plans and have said that you rely on you getting back into the EU. Now, that is very unlikely to happen. You're not going to get that revenue you're expecting. And actually, if you were to leave the UK, economists are saying that will reduce your economic growth. Mm. So you're not even going to have the funds to try and support he? these public services like you're promising. Well, well, let's unpack both of those figures because they come from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which has obviously been very clear about the £18 billion pounds worth of cuts that Labour and the Conservatives are proposing. But in terms of our figures, they've actually said that our estimate of about £30 billion in additional tax revenue by re-entering uh, the EU is not unreasonably high. And we've set out our approach. We are unashamedly pro-European Union. And I'll re re remind you when it comes to democracy that a majority of people in Scotland voted to remain. And how did that go? So the IFS has set out that clearly. It also talks about the prospects of an independent country using figures that are very much based on Scotland's position within uh, the rest of the UK. We know that the UK runs a very unequal economy with a lot of the activity concentrated in London and the South East. And what we say is look to comparable other small European countries, see how they outperform the UK okay. and look at the prospects for what Scotland might be able to achieve. Um, access, for example, to the biggest single market in the world. Yeah. yeah. She's so clear, isn't she, when she's explaining things? So she's so clear. She's so clear. Mm -hmm. I wonder I sort of think, well, does she, does she practice in front of a mirror or is it just like she's just got it? Basically she's got it and she, she can she like can come too. out. So she mentioned in that clip the IFS Institute for Fiscal Studies and what they've been they've had a, obviously had a look at um at the SNP's figures. But sort of separately from that, they also just look generally at how well the Scottish economy is doing. And mm -hmm. um, there was a, a recent um, little exchange on BBC, uh, BBC Scotland with a spokesman from the IFS. And, and, and he was just giving the IFS view on 
on the Scottish economies. I think the first thing to note is actually Scotland is one of the more better off regions of the UK. It's behind London and the southeast of England, uh, but it's well ahead of the Midlands and north of England, uh, not to mention Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland's got a broad based economy, a relatively well educated workforce, although of course oil and gas and associated activity onshore uh, do loom much larger than they do uh, in the rest of the UK. I think looking at growth recently, Scotland has very slightly outperformed growth in the rest of the UK over the last few years, at least once you just for lower population growth. So on a per person basis, Scotland's economy is slightly larger than before the pandemic, whilst in the rest of the UK it's very slightly lower. I like well, it. I heard that when I thought, I'm surprised the BBC Scotland let that go out, actually, but maybe they were doing it live and they didn't have any... Oh, that's terribly cynical of me. You know, smaller number of people doing doing a lot of heavy lifting there. Yes, indeed. Mm. Not you and me, of course, because... We're not economically <laughs> active. We're terribly busy and we're being hell of a productive, but yeah, we don't oh. appear in those stats. I think we should probably write a wee paper for the IFS just to say, you know, you ought to take into account the independence voluntary sector. I, I was also just having a wee look at um, what Labour have been saying and, and um, the easiest way of, of looking at what they've been saying is to look at Mr Starmer's first six steps. I noticed that they really like union jacks on their promotions and they actually quite like Welsh Dragon. I've never seen a saltire on their <laughs> And also, I've never seen a union jack on their promotions in Scotland. There they go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was, that was very yeah. if, if you blink if you blink there thought you missed it yeah so i had a little look at the the first first, first steps and um and then twigged that there's a there's first steps for england and wales and then there's different first steps for scotland really yes interesting interesting so first six steps here we go England and Wales first six steps economic stability cut NHS waiting times a new border security command and and he's looking very commanding isn't he Mr set up great British energy crack down on antisocial behavior and recruit six and a half thousand new teachers so that's England and Wales here's Scotland deliver economic stability that's the same Cut NHS waiting. Even though the NHS is devolved in Scotland. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So that's that's also that's also the same. But as you say, it's not within his power to do that, really. And then and then it gets to gets to be different. So then the third one here is set up Great British Energy. Mm. After that, we've got make work pay. I, I think uh, that what? to me is a, a, a daft kind of way of putting it. I, I had to go and look it up to find out what that meant. But basically, well, that... it's, it's a reference to their um, to policies that they're going to do about, um, you know, like zero hours, cutting cutting back on when zero hours contracts can be used and, and um, uh, the, the minimum wage. It's that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's the kind of policy you'd hope that a Labour it... Party would be putting in. That's interesting, though, because make work pay was one of the arguments for universal credit. Yes. And, you know, having poor people much yes. poorer than people yes. in work. So it's it got was. connotations. And, and it, that it was. And that was what came into my mind first when I read make work mm. pay. I thought, oh, that's all that Tory stuff about making it difficult to be on um, yeah. benefits without, you know, you've got to have six jobs. and. Yeah still go in and see someone every week and explain to them why you're not having why you don't have seven jobs so it's, it's an interesting one to use but to be fair to them it does refer to their work condition policy and then the fifth one create jobs and opportunities for young people well but not in not in england and wales, not, in england and wales well, not first and again you know it's not the kind of thing that's really within their power to do that and also, you know, Scotland's approaching full employment. Our problem is that we've got huge vacancies all in yeah. all sorts of sectors because of Brexit. Not that we've got a whole load of young people sitting around with no yeah. jobs. Yeah, exactly. That's a weird I, one. I know it is. And um, mm. and then number six, maximise Scotland's influence. To do have, you, have, have you noticed that he looks a bit gentler and he's got a little bit of a a little bit of a smile there? You know, compared to compared to commander. Oh yeah, so he's definitely you know uh, admiral admiral on the bridge about to go into you know 
battle looks, against the, the armada you know, or something. He looks to I'm, me I'm, like their sort of maths teacher who's who's just fed oh up God, of the class yeah. behaving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And and notice that in the English one, you know, they had uh, recruit six and a half thousand new teachers, and that's not in in the Scottish one. Again, maybe that that will also would be something that isn't within their power to. Now but, you've pointed it out, it is quite noticeable. That's a completely different facial expression on this one. It's as if, oh, nice, caring, cuddly Scotland and, you know, <laughs> we'll sock it to you, you wasters in England. That, that's amazing, isn't it? Um, fascinating. It, 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 there's quite a lot that could be drawn out from these six steps. The one I kind of focused on a little bit more was to do with Great British Energy. Oh, and yeah. So this is an, an interview, uh, mm -hmm. a lady called Kate Blake, who's an Aberdeenshire councillor, actually, and she's standing as a Labour candidate up, uh, up there on the local radio. She's asked quite a gentle question just about, could you say a bit more about GB Energy? Because we all want to know a bit more we all about want GB to know. Energy. So. We do all want to know. So yeah. here, come on, here, Kate, here she tell goes. Us it. Here she goes. Can you explain a bit more to the listeners about what GB Energy is actually going to be? Because there seems to be some confusion about it. Um, Keir Starmer said that it wouldn't produce any electricity, but yet it's still, uh, we're told it's going to produce tens of thousands of jobs. How do you not produce any energy and yet still produce tens of thousands of jobs? So GB Energy will be the way that it be a vehicle that we work with private industry as well to create thousands of clean power jobs um, here in the northeast of Scotland and in Scotland. Um, it, it's, it's about investing. Do you even know if the headquarters are going to be here? We do. We know they will be in Scotland. Do we do, know whereabouts in Scotland are going to be? We do not know whereabouts in Scotland. If it's just one great big investment vehicle, what happens if those investments go wrong and, you know, private companies don't do brilliantly with the government money? What happens to the jobs and the transition to net zero then? Well, there are a number of different strands to this. So, no, obviously, there is GB Energy. There is the other things that we're looking at, that we're looking at will obviously be around our commitment to upgrade hundreds of thousands of homes, um, cold and drafty homes. There is obviously the um, investment in ports, there's the investment in... So there's a number of different strands to this, um, the, to how that we will take forward clean energy and okay. deliver lower bills. Well, so, many poor way, Kate, Kate wasn't really very clear on that. However, and it's one of these these things that there's just been GB Energy. Somehow it will mysteriously reduce prices and and have lots of jobs, and then it will be this, and it will be great. And mm -hmm. and Kate needs to needs to get a better answer than that. However, we do have a definitive answer um, from Mr. Starmer. Here he goes. Ooh, it's right. very short. Go, who who would actually be in ownership then of that infrastructure that you're funding in order for GB Energy to actually generate its own energy? W would this be well, via local authorities? You, you talked about private sector involvement too, but I'm just trying to clarify the extent to which it would actually be generating its own electricity and that would all be publicly owned. Well, no, it'd be an investment vehicle, so um, not an energy company. So it's an investment vehicle in the energy of the future. The money going into it um, would be public money, but used to trigger private investment. It was not what it was promoted as when the energy first uh, came up. But anyway, at least we know that now. And you, I, you, were, you were saying to me you saw a, a bit of a parallel between setting that up and, and, and Gordon Brown's old... Um, private funding initiatives, PFI. Oh, yeah. No, they're not quite the same thing. But when you think about what he is now expecting, it's not going to create or generate any energy. It's public money going in and then private. Now, we've heard a figure of 75% would be private investment. Now, 
that is essentially what PFI was about. It was a public-private partnership. The investors put money in, and then they expect a sizable reward. And we do know from the PFI contracts that we're still paying for, that have been paid for hospitals several times over, over the last 20 years, we know um, how much money can be made for a private sector investment in those kind of vehicles. The, the public money is going to come from a windfall tax on the oil industry, which we know the oil industry itself is also saying, well, that could lose you up to 100,000 yeah. jobs. Yeah. Um, so the money which is going in is going to be a quarter of what the investment is, and then the rest is coming from the private sector. So yeah. it's just another private sector investment vehicle from what well, I Well, yes, say. indeed. And OK, so, so it's a lot less than... It's a lot less than what everyone in Scotland means, and probably the same in Wales as well, when you say um, publicly owned energy company, we know what we mean by that, and it's not what he's just described. It's not what he it's means. It's not I mean, that at all. And, and, and I thought, well, oh, OK, it's not that. Basically, it sounds to me that it's a way of priming the pump to, to loosen up, to access private investment by putting some um, public money into it. Well, at the very least, surely then, we ought to end up owning some of whatever it is that well, it's, it's put. But I've never, heard, is, I've never heard that stated. Certainly been in a couple of the manifestos that we've seen on the inter parties about owning a stake in renewable energy companies in the same way as all sorts of other governments do. Now, we know there are issues that the Scottish government isn't able to own electricity generation because of the Scotland Act, but there are ways around that. But... That doesn't seem to be what he's saying. Now, if it was 25% of whatever this green industry is, is going to be owned by the public and the money will come back to the public and that's how you lower your bills, great. But that's not what they're saying. I do have a clip from somebody more expert than me to explain a bit more about their reservations. When something sounds too good to be true, and it almost all, always is in these kind of election uh, discussions, it probably is. The reality is that although bills may have gone down a bit this year, to carry the programme forward that needs to be done for net zero is a huge cost. And uh, it's simply not true that uh, uh, we're all going to benefit from cheap energy anytime soon. And Great British Energy, well, you know, it's another institution in what's a now an extremely crowded space. But the telling thing about uh, Great British Energy for all the noise and the websites, etc., is its budget is absolutely tiny. And what's more, it depends on the oil price staying up because it's going to be paid for by windfall taxes from North Sea oil production. And of course, oil prices can go down as well as up. And there's no explanation of what happens to its funding if the windfall tax turned out not to deliver this relatively small six billion or so over the entire parliament going forward. But the idea that we can get to uh, completely decarbonizing the electricity system, and that means making either getting rid of the gas, which is uh, uh, about the most important generator of uh, uh, power uh, within five years, or completely switch to carbon storage for that gas in that period, is just not plausible. The, you know, we need a new transmission system in order to uh, bring all this renewables onto the system. You know, it's low density, intermittent, geographically dispersed, etc. And, you know, we haven't really started on that job yet. These things, I'm afraid, take time. And if you try and put five bricks on the accelerator and really rush to the deadline, uh, in this case, 230, you're probably going to make it even more expensive than it otherwise would have been. Interesting. So, that's interesting. Uh, that's I, haven't, an... I haven't seen that before. That's very good. Yeah. Then the other couple of clips I've got is there's a lot of figures being thrown around um, so far. And although we don't know how any jobs are going to result from an investment vehicle, I mean, that sounds to me like a couple of folk in a corner office with a computer. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, yes, but very high salaries. Now, be fair, very, they very will have very high salaries. Indeed, they will. <laughs> but let's have a look at even just two random Labour people, what figures they come up with, and that you'll spot they're quite different. GV Energy, a publicly owned energy company headquartered in Scotland that will boost our energy security, will create tens of thousands of skilled and well paid jobs, and lower people's bills in this cost of living crisis. That'd be, that'd be very good. 
Tens of thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah. That was from uh, one of the hustings, the Allo hustings. That was yep. uh, Brian Leishman, who's the Labour candidate. Okay. From... So that was tens of thousands of jobs, lower energy bills. OK, who yeah. else have we got? And here we've got Pam Duncan Glancy. Look at the, the New Deal for Working People. Could you see the, the, the Conservatives right, no, supporting that? Hold on, right. Um, but... GB Energy, bringing down bills by £1,400 a year, bringing 63,000 jobs to Scotland. Pam reckons yeah. there'll be more jobs. 63,000 she came up with and also she quoted a figure for 1400 pounds off our electricity bills well oh, that'd be great that would pretty much wipe well that would that would wipe ours out actually i mean we'd be in we'd be we'd have ex, we'd have excess cash at that point yeah but how how is this going to happen when's it going to happen I, it just isn't credible but the only piece of actual information that is the not the most we've seen that's the logo for great british energy i mean notice the red white and blue colors but does that not look like a, a farting light bulb to you <laughs> i mean what is that well i hope they didn't pay too much for that bit of design work because certainly i, I mean did. you and i could have come up with probably uh, better than that publicly owned great. energy company that will lower bills well yeah. that's it that's that stated and but no way of finding out. Yes, GB Energy. I think the um, the jury's well and truly out because we just don't seem to have any kind of consistent information. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it? I'm sorry. As far as I'm concerned, the jury is back in, came back in very quickly and went. You're right. And even the <laughs> name rules it out as far as oh, half yeah, of Scotland. The other one I've got, Mary Black said something that I just thought, oh, that's a really sensible thing to say. For a lot of people, I think this election might be their last sort of the last chance that they give the union to an extent because we have had a conservative government for you know well over a decade now and if labor fail to deliver the um, the level of change that they are promising then i would expect to see the support for independence begin to rise and the thing that always frustrates me about this and particularly i suppose more with labor uh, politicians and party members is I actually think the unionist parties have the most to gain from independence because it would allow Scottish Labour to actually be Scottish Labour without having to worry about what's being said or approved down in London. It would allow the Conservatives to sort of sever that toxic sort of connection or the, the muscle memory of Thatcher and all the rest of it. Whereas the minute Scotland becomes independent, the SNP served its purpose. You know, it, it, I, that's what I think politics in Scotland could actually be really exciting and really hopeful and that we would finally have a breakdown of parties who were making promises that they, if, presuming they win the election, they would have the powers to either deliver on it or not deliver on it. So I thought that was quite a, an interesting... Well, I think that's a good place to finish. Mm. So I hope the, um, the various... Uh, things that we talked about in this episode of Election Countdown have been helpful. If it put, helps put things, a few things that have been talked about in the media, in the news, if it helps to put those into a wider perspective, then I would I would think that we'd have done a decent job with this with this mm. episode. I enjoyed putting it together because I was finding things that I hadn't quite kind of taken on board properly. So I hope everyone else has as well. Okay, so we'll probably be back next week when we're hoping to have some interviews with various candidates um, just to see in the last week of the campaign how it's going, how they're feeling, how it's going. Yeah, the second, second last week of the campaign. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it just seems like it's been going on for months. A week on Thursday will be the actual election. Yeah. So at that point, you and I can take ourselves off for a nice lunch somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> good good so okay. yeah so we'll see once you all again bye people bye, bye. everyone bye.